Welcome to the inauguration of the Sustainable Finance Lab. My name is Kent Eriksson. I'm one of the directors of the lab. I will also be the moderator for today. And to start, I would like to show the agenda for the day. First off, we have the chairperson of the steering committee of the Sustainable Finance Lab, followed by my co-director of the lab. This will be followed by presentations by the Swedish Minister of Financial Markets, the Director General for Vinova, Sweden's Innovation Agency, and the President of KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. After that, we will hear from you in the Mentimeter session, and this will be followed by presentations by researchers of the Sustainable Finance Lab. But now I give the floor to Rebecca Wolfing, who is the Public Affairs Manager at NASDAQ and also the Chairperson of the Steering Committee of the Sustainable Finance Lab. Thank you so much, Kent. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as we finally launch the Sustainable Finance Lab, a transdisciplinary research center established to transform financial markets and to enhance the development of society. My name is Rebecca Wolfing, and I'm honored to serve as chairwoman for the lab steering committee, as well as a representative for NASDAQ, one of many important industry partners to the center. I understand that transforming the financial market to become more sustainable may sound as a big and to some impossible task to take on. But from the perspective I approach this, it's not impossible at all, quite the opposite. Why? Because we all have the right tools to accomplish real change. Sweden and the entire Nordic as a region has a strong tradition of prioritizing the road to a more sustainable society. For example, Swedish policymakers have decided that we are to reach net zero emissions by 2045 at the latest and thereafter have negative emissions. Their goal is to make Sweden the world's first fossil free welfare state. So how do policymakers dare to set up such clear and ambitious goals? The reason is the same to why I believe that the Sustainable Finance Lab will accomplish a difference. The word is collaboration. We are fortunate enough to live in a society where policymakers, scholars, and corporations are used to operate together to solve issues and to evolve. And that is exactly what this research lab intends to do. When we came together in the lab to talk about our strengths and weaknesses, everyone agreed that the big advantage that we have is that we work in an interdisciplinary fashion, combining different perspectives to reach our goals. Representing NASDAQ, an industry partner, among others like Danske Bank and Folksam, we from our side can see that companies do want to make a real change. Looking at the over 1,000 companies traded across the Nordic, we can see that they want to contribute to this change. What is sometimes lacking is the knowledge on how they can contribute. And that is where the experts from the six universities enters the scene. One of the many talented scholars that will help and drive this change is Malin Malmström, professor in innovation and entrepreneurship at Luleå Technological University. I look forward to hearing what you have to say, Malin. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind introduction, Rebecca. And it is my pleasure to introduce Sustainable Finance Lab to you today. Our vision with Sustainable Finance Lab is transforming the world towards sustainability through financial markets. And we are committed to being a transformative force to develop relevant knowledge and co-create innovation. 
guided by our vision, we will work with shifting norms and beliefs to support a sustainable future and support transformative innovation and change. We are a national competence center consisting of six universities and research institute, KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology represented by Kent Eriksson, Luleå University of Technology represented by me, Malin Malmström, Stockholm School of Economics represented by Lynn Leerpold, University of Gothenburg represented by Joachim Sandberg, Stockholm University represented by Beatrice Krona and IVL, the Swedish Environmental Research Institute represented by Mark Sanctuary. And each representative is part of the management team and Kent uh, Eriksson and I are the directors of Sustainable Finance Lab. And we're proud and thankful to have the engagement and commitment of many prominent industry partners and we certainly look forward to work with them. Based on the research frontier and identified urgent practical needs, we have developed four main themes uh, for our forthcoming work. The first theme is science-based assessment of impact, which focuses on generating knowledge for how financial instruments and metrics need to change to support sustainability. The second theme focuses reconceptualizing risk and opportunity for social and environmental sustainability. Our third theme deals with sustainable policies and norms, which focuses how norms and policies can drive development and change for sustainability. And the fourth and final theme supports transformative innovation and change, which is the research theme in itself, but is also the platform for our lab function. You will be able to hear more about each of these themes later on today, but for now, thank you and back to you, Kent. Thank you, Malin, and it is with great pleasure and anticipation that I now present Åsa Lindhagen, the Minister of Financial Markets in Sweden. Åsa? So, thank you so much. I uh, would like to start by uh, extend my gratitude uh, to the organizers of this event. But first and foremost, I would like to extend my gratitude for the initiative of setting up the Sustainable Finance Lab to tackle some of the pivotal challenges relating to sustainability and financial markets. We are in an acute climate crisis. Last autumn, uh, forests were on fire in California and hundreds of thousands of Americans uh, were forced to flee their home. In the Arctic and on Antarctica, the ices are melting in the line of the most extreme scenarios of the UN climate panel. In several places of the world, hunger is on the rise and uh, due to climate change, and as always, it is the poor that are affected the most. We have uh, witnessed floods and hurricane winds in Italy, flooding in Bangladesh, so heat waves in Europe and one billion animals that have died in Australia. What we are witnessing now today is uh, nothing but a light breeze compared to what awaits us if we do not act. Still, many not the least politicians lack the necessary insight and willingness to act. And this is also true when it comes to the uh, uh, environmental crisis. We are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction of species in the history of Earth. And to put this uh, under some context, the last mass extinction occurred 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died out. It doesn't happen that often, and it is a catastrophe. And we will not manage the climate crisis uh, if we do not also take care of the Earth's uh, biodiversity. It creates a more resilient planet uh, that is better fit to resist climate change. Climate and biodiversity are connected. These times that we live in with the climate crisis and then an uh, environmental crisis, uh, but also radical nationalistic and anti-democratic forces growing around the world, 
these times are frightening me. But they are also giving me an immense strong feeling that it is possibly, it has possibly never been so important to be a human on Earth as now. I think we live in crucial times. Hence, if there is any moment in time when to engage in a better world at one's workplace, in research and science, at the university, in an organization, in the private sector, or in a political party, or in any other way, is that moment in time not now? So, what can we do? And uh, what can be done on uh, the financial markets? I am convinced that the financial markets uh, have an important role in the transition to sustainability. Money is power. Directing the money towards sustainable activities is important. And not only important, it is crucial if we are to succeed with the transition. Those financial markets and financial market actors can play a crucial role in the transition to sustainable society and a sustainable economy. As a clear recognition of the pivotal role of the financial sector and the importance of political action to steer capital towards sustainable investments, in 2015 the RIXTA adopted the goal that the financial systems must contribute to uh, uh, sustainable development. And since then, we have made a lot of progress uh, on the development of a sustainable financial system, not the least uh, have uh, this uh, risen to become an important issue in the EU policy agenda. A far cry from the situation that my predecessor Per Bolund experienced when he, as uh, not that many years ago, raised the importance of EU policy to also address sustainability within the financial markets. He was then met with heads uh, shaking at what was viewed as irrelevant. Uh, in just a few years, these heads have instead started to nod, agreeing to what is now viewed as an obvious task for EU policy making on financial markets. Nonetheless, we need to speed up the change and do more. In order to do so, we need a better understanding uh, of the functioning of the financial system and how it can contribute to both environmental and social sustainability. In this context, the financial market research is crucial to increase knowledge of uh, how the financial market works and to improve our understanding of the challenges uh, that the economy is facing. Research in this area can serve as a basis for the development of more efficient and accurate tools to handle the challenges that we are facing, not the, uh, the least related to sustainability. This is necessary to be able to achieve the Paris Climate Accord and the Sustainable Development Goals. And in the light of this, the government last year uh, strengthened its long-term commitment to financial market research by increasing the funding uh, for the coming years. And financial market uh, research was also recognized as part of the government's strategy to reboot the economy after the COVID crisis. And the Swedish Agency for Innovation Systems, Vinova, allocates this funding as part of uh, an initiative for financial market research focusing on the transition to a sustainable economy. As I already mentioned, the financial market has a crucial role to play when it comes to sustainability. And needless to say, therefore, I am excited to attend uh, the launch of the Sustainable Finance Lab, a unique project that this uh, funding has contributed to. And I believe that combining researches from different universities within sustainability and financial markets provides an opportunity for real change. We are running out uh, of time uh, in the fight against climate change. We need to make progress fast on how financial markets interconnect and to and facilitate social and environmental sustainability, both in Sweden and internationally. Daring to think in uh, new terms of risks and norms and, and policies will be crucial to, uh, to the success of both this initiative and for our chances to managing the transition to a sustainable economy and avoiding the worst consequences of the climate change. 
And I'm convinced you will dare to do so uh, in the Sustainable Finance Lab. So as much as I'm happy in this uh, launch, what really excites me is what results the lab will produce going forward. So um, thank you very much. And uh, don't forget, you have no time to lose. Thank you, Minister. We will work very hard to help you. Um, and the Sustainable Finance Lab is funded by Vinova, Sweden's innovation agency. And it is with great pleasure and gratitude that I present its Director General, Darja Isaksson. Darja. Uh, <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak at this launch of the Sustainable Finance Lab. I'm really proud that Vinova is one of the main funding agencies of this initiative, and there's a history to that. Um, in 2009, the Swedish government commissioned Vinova to consult with the Swedish Research Council and implement a long-term investment in financial market research. And in 2019, we received a new renewed commission to fi fund financial market research in order to deepen the scientific understanding of the current and coming transformation in financial markets in terms of financial stability and well-functioning markets. But further knowledge is needed on how the financial system can be developed in perspective of the high rate of change that's taken place recently since the global financial crisis, more recently in the ongoing pandemic. But more importantly, we do need more knowledge on financial markets in relation to the urgent climate crisis and the need to transform into a sustainable society. And this knowledge needs to be put into practice real quick. Because we all are now aware that what science clearly tells us, we're a generation working towards hard deadlines now. These deadlines are set by the planet, which care very little for our risk appetite or our willingness to invest. It's therefore encouraging to notice how monumental capital efforts are currently made by Swedish industry, for instance, in order to produce the batteries needed for a fossil free society in the case of Northvolt, all the investments needed to transform steel production into a fossil free industry in the case of hybrid. These are examples of companies who understand that this transformation is not only necessary and urgent, but also the biggest opportunity for value creation since the first industrial revolution. We also notice that as ESG reporting becomes more mainstream in the world, more and more institutional investors are beginning to shift their portfolios from climate risk to climate solutions and also have an increased focus on ESG as a whole with the changing discourse on inequality and debt, just to name a few examples. But yet we need to accelerate this transformation in order to provide children already in school the opportunity to live in a society that's better than ours. Uh, and avoid the worst risks, as we heard the minister say. Now, you know, with all this in mind, uh, we never decided to launch a call for a competence center with a focus on research and sustainability, transformation and renewal of the financial market and industry. We decided to welcome applicants with a capacity, perspective and ambition to conduct multidisciplinary research on the financial market with a perspective of sustainable transformation in its purpose, tools and actors, and with a clear research focus on sustainability when it comes to climate, environment and social perspectives. In other words, we were looking for a competence center for societal transformation, where the center should join forces with private and public financial market participants, as well as non-traditional players with potential future impact on the financial market. Now, several external global experts were asked to look for potential uh, of excellence in research collaboration between actors throughout Sweden with the ambitions expressed. And the Sustainable, sustainable Finance Lab came out on top. We have really high hopes for this center when it comes to its focus on sustainability, transformation and renewal of the financial markets and the financial industry uh, through uh, coming up with also innovative new tools and involvement of new actors that can really make a difference. So as an innovation agency, we're very much looking forward to the results of your future work. But for today, let me first thank you very much for the work that you have already put in, in building the commitment and the momentum required for establishing this new valuable resource in our research community. Thank you so much. Director General, thank you very much. We will certainly make a super strong effort to 
live up to the expectations you have. Uh, now, the Sustainable Finance Lab is hosted by KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. And I would now like to introduce the president of KTH, Sigrid Karlsson. Thank you. KTH is very happy to announce the inauguration of the Sustainable Finance Lab. KTH is an engineering university and covers all of the engineering subjects, including the ones represented in this new Sustainable Finance Lab. We thank Vinova for granting us the opportunity to set up and run the lab and the Swedish government for the funding of the lab. The Sustainable Finance Lab will develop research and practice so that the financial markets can help transform the world towards sustainability. Sustainable development is one of KTH four pillars. So in line with this, I'm very glad to see this ambitious, very ambitious effort where KTH will work together with other university uh, research institutes and industry partners to make this happen. Sustainable Finance Lab is a KTH-led consortium for, uh, of seven academic partners, Luleå University of Technology, Gothenburg University, Stockholm School of Economics, IVL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University and Global Economic Dynamics and the Biosphere at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The Sustainable Finance Lab is very much a joint effort of these academic partners. And we think it is necessary to make a collaborative effort to meet the challenge to create a more sustainable future. The role of science in general is really important in creating a sustainable future. But in, in mainly we can say it, it's twofold. The first task for the scientist is to develop a better understanding on how to measure human impact on the global, global ecosystem. And the second task is to develop an increased understanding of what should be measured because the global, global ecosystem is very complex. There is an old saying that what gets measured gets done. And the role of science is to identify what should get measured and to develop accurate measures to get it done. The Sustainable Finance Lab will do research on how finance can promote sustainability. And let me mention that there is another old saying that money rules the world. It is true that the transformation towards a more sustainable future needs financial resources for it to happen fast. The Sustainable Finance Lab not only develops research for how finance can lead to a more sustainable world, but they also partner with financial services firms to facilitate real change in practice. We are very happy that so many industry partners have chosen to team up with the SFL Research Consortium. Forgive me if I do not mention each and every one just now, but I do wish to express my gratitude for that you join us. It's an important task to solve sustainable development and we need to work together and this consortium really show that a joint effort will make it happen. And with this, I wish the best of luck to the Sustainable Finance Lab Consortium and its industry partners in creating a more sustainable future through finance. And I hope to see more of the lab as it goes along and take part in the new findings that the consortium will produce. Thank you. Thank you, President. We will be as visible as we possibly can and make as strong an impact as we possibly can. But we have talked about us now for a while. I would like to, to uh, reach out to you and uh, hear what you are. And for that, we have a mantic question. So I would like you to uh, enter the mantic site that you see on the screen now 
menti.com and you have a code that you should enter. It's 67363487. And here you can mark which sector of society you belong to. And we have some results already coming in. Great, thank you very much. Rebecca, what do you think? This is interesting, isn't it? It's very, yeah, I'm glad to see that there are, you know, several areas represented here today. I personally would have wished that we would have a little bit of a higher poll in the finance, uh, in the finance sector, but I'm also very pleased to see the great attendance among the academics because ultimately it's your ideas and your research that are gonna drive us forward and make us understand what we need to do in order to create a more sustainable financial market. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. And we see that the uh, the biggest, uh, can you help me here, Rebecca? Yeah, the biggest not... one is uh, academia, followed by a tie between finance and other I'm a little bit intrigued to what is this other poll. 10% uh, represent, 9% represented from, from the government, and we have a 2% from media. Now finance went up a little bit. That's pleasing me, at least. <laughs> well, I'm happy to see that there is such a strong interest from several sectors, and uh, I'm especially intrigued by the others here. <laughs> We will certainly reach out to you in the Sustainable Finance Lab to make sure that we provide a platform for you to join us in the future. Okay, so Rebecca, could you help me uh, with the final results? Which was so the... the final results coming in at 36% academia, 31% from finance, 9% from government, 2% still from media, and then the mysterious one, 23% from the others. As you said, we need to find a way to reach out to this, this sector yeah. to see where they are really coming from and to look how we can incorporate them in our work. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for assisting me. And uh, it is great to hear that there is such a diverse audience to our presentation today. We will now focus on the presentations from researchers of the Sustainable Finance Lab. And these presentations will be done uh, by pairing researchers with partners from industry that we work together with. And uh, first out, we have Stockholm, uh, Mark Sanctuary, and Emma Bylund and Magnus Jonsson from uh, this Riksbanken, the Bank of Sweden. So I now give the floor to Mark, Emma, and Magnus. All right. Thank you very much. I am very excited to be part of uh, the Sustainable Finance Lab. I'm very happy to see us uh, being launched, and I'm looking forward to working with such a great team on these important questions. <clears throat> now, as we've heard, one of the objectives that we have for our Sustainable Finance Lab is to support collaboration between uh, practice and, 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 and research. And so what we're gonna do the next four, uh, uh, next part of the agenda is, to, uh, is to, uh, to highlight some of the work that we wanna do uh, on, uh, under the lab. Um, and uh, we're gonna be providing, as Ken said, four pairs of, of presentations. And uh, each pair of presentations is gonna to touch on some of the work that we wanna do under the lab. And uh, 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 each pair of presentations will include a practitioner and a researcher. Uh, so I have the honor of starting and uh, I will be talking about the impact of climate change on our economy and how we can be better prepared to uh, to manage these risks. And I'll be joined, uh, yeah, I'll present first and then I'll hand it over to, to Emma. Uh, so I don't have any slides, so I guess I'll just uh, jump right into it. Uh, uh, so 
if you ask if you ask business leaders, and I'm going to present a specific, I'm going to zoom down now and talk about a specific research project that we have have uh, have uh, 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 underway already uh, at the lab. Now, if you ask businesses to rank the risks that they face, then often supply chain risks and and climate risks they rank pretty high. And the fact is that we know very little about the intersection of these risks. But what we do know is that production processes in our modern economy are increasingly involving a sequence of steps that can be done across many countries. And then these steps are being increasingly specialized. And when you organize production in this way, you expose your domestic economy, the Swedish economy, to events, extreme events that can happen far away in other countries. And so that's what we wanna look at for this research project. We wanna delve into this issue and ask, in our super interconnected global economy, what is the impact of foreign extreme weather events on the Swedish economy? So the basic idea is that you have a storm and some, some extreme weather event in some faraway place, and that disrupts the economy over there, disrupts exports from that country, and it means that Sweden is not, Swedish companies are, are not able to obtain the inputs that they need in order to produce. And if Swedish, can, if Swedish companies cannot obtain these inputs, then they have to adapt, they have to change, and they may even suffer losses. And that's what we want to study. We want to see how these companies adapt and how much they, uh, how much they suffer in terms of, of, of losses. Now, you could be forgiven for saying, hold on a minute, Mark, uh, you know, the impact of these foreign storms far off in some other country must have a non-important impact on, on our economy. And after all, isn't purchasing inputs from multiple, uh, multiple countries a good way to manage your risk? And to some degree, that might be part of what's happening there. But there's also reasons to believe that actually these kinds of extreme weather events might have an outsized impact on our economy. So one mechanism that's at play here is that our modern economy involves increasingly specialized inputs to production. It's just not very easy for companies in the short run to adapt to these unexpected shocks and find alternative uh, inputs in their production. Another mechanism that comes in is that advances in supply chains and uh, uh, shipping and, uh, and logistics mean that companies have been able to reduce their dependence on large inventories. So these types of mechanisms uh, make, uh, make supply chains rigid and potentially vulnerable to extreme weather uh, shocks that, uh, that might affect them. So this, uh, this, this, uh, this work, uh, and it's underway right now, we have a, a working paper coming out uh, soon, and, uh, and I hope that uh, I can gather your, your input, uh, uh, input on and, and feedback, so please let me know if you want a copy of it. But it's going to be uh, an, empirical, an empirical investigation, and we want to use our uh, amazing data resources to delve into what's happening at uh, the company level in Sweden, and then uh, to be able to zoom out and to look at what these impacts mean at the aggregate level for the entire Swedish economy. Uh, so that's all I've got for now. I can hand over to, to, uh, to, uh, to Emma, um, but I can close off by saying that I hope that this specific research project can help us better understand the the channels through which climate change will affect our economy, the kind of stresses, economic stresses that, uh, that climate change uh, will cause to our economy and help us uh, make better investment decisions. Emma, you have the mic. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I have a presentation prepared, so I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, can you see the presentation now? Yeah, it looks good. Let's see. So first of all, thank you for inviting us at the Riksbank to participate today. And from a monetary policy perspective, it is important to recognize and research the economic impacts of climate change. And like the research that you just told about, Mark, and the other th things you have written about, um, they could help you provide insights on some of these impacts. So. I'm briefly going to go through the Riksbank's role in climate work and then speak a bit more about an economic commentary me and my colleague Magnus Jonsson wrote this fall. 
And at the Riggs Bank, we believe there's value in taking climate change into account in our work, and we currently do, can be seen here on the screen. So there's research and analysis, um, financial supervision, which is stress testing and cooperation with other authorities, hopefully the Sustainable Finance Lab, and currently it's in particular NGFS, which is Central Banks and Supervising Authorities Network for Greening the Financial System. And then lastly, incorporating a sustainability perspective in management of the FX reserve and corporate bonds purchases. So to circle back to the first um, category, I will present an example of something we at the Riggs Bank has done to further our research and analysis. And that is an economic commentary called How Does Climate Change Affect the Long Run Interest Rate? So, um, I believe it's worth explaining why the long run real interest rate is important for monetary policy. And this long run real rate is commonly believed to be unaffected by monetary policy and is instead determined by other factors such as demography and real growth. So the long run rate serves as a benchmark rate for monetary policy and the average policy rate or Styrianta has to be adjusted in line with changes in the long run real interest rate for us to be able to fulfill the inflation target. And our economic commentary was inspired by an NGFS report in June last year. And they found, and I'm highlighting the quote here, uh, that central banks would benefit from an enhanced assessment of the potential impact on the natural interest rate, because that could reveal that policy space is more limited than previously thought. So, Climate change poses various types of risk for the economy. I think we all know that. We have the physical transition risks and risks of irreversible threshold effects. And what we believe is that these climate change risks in turn affect the economy via weaker growth prospects, increased uncertainty of the economic development, and an increased risk for disasters, all of which could affect the long run real interest rate. So in our commentary, we use standard economic theory to quantify these three effects of climate change on the long run real interest rate. And we find that these effects of climate can lower the long run real interest rate. So, uh, and they are under certain conditions significant. They vary from almost zero to about two percentage points uh, lower long run real interest rate. So it's, it can be really significant and However, as I mentioned, they, they vary a lot depending on the assumptions we make, and this are a bit uncertain. But obviously, we now wonder what the policy implications can be from this. And I'm not going to go into detail here. It's just that, as the quote highlighted, we could experience a more limited monetary policy space and reach the lower bound more often. And we may also have greater risk for the financial system, which means that financial stability and um, coordination between monetary policy and macro potential policy would be more important. And yeah, I don't have time to go through all the policy implications, but if you want to, you can just read our economic commentary at the Expense website. But this is an example of a work um, we have done with the climate change, and I believe we can come up with several projects together that would be really interesting to further research. So thank you for listening. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much, much, Mark and Emma from Riksbank. And I found that very interesting. What did you think, Rebecca? Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, I think it's great to see that the Bank of Sweden is taking uh, the climate change risk into aspect when they are creating their line of policy. I think that that's going to be uh, a, a guidance for us moving forward in our work, really. Thank you, Rebecca. That's a very good reflection. And now we will hear from the Stockholm School of Economics and Lannebo Fonder. So I give the word to Lynn Leopold, Sophie Nackemson Ekvall, and Mats Gustafsson. Lynn? Thank you, Kent. So hello, everyone. How wonderful that so many of you wanted to find out more about our new research consortium. 
Here at the Stockholm School of Economics, we will focus on the social dimensions of sustainable finance. And I thought I'd give you a really quick overview of the projects that are either in a design stage or ongoing. So let me uh, quickly share my screen here. There we go. Um, so investors are increasingly seeking guidance on how to bring human rights and democracy development into their investment decisions. And human rights has been spoken of, of uh, really as the next frontier in sustainable finance. Thus investment impact on democracy development and human rights is a new project in, a, in really in the design phase. Uh, where we hope to contribute to a better understanding and develop a model for more broadly considering the S in ESG. A second project very much engages with the current debate on what the outcomes of negative screening versus active ownership actually are. Though many financial market actors claim the positive outcomes of active ownership, others also argue that dialogue and active ownership is greenwashing or gives only a potential impact that may even also be too slow. In reality, there's very little research on actual outcomes. So this is a project that uh, Kent Joachim at uh, Gothenburg University, and then you'll hear more from later, and I will be doing, and it will involve both quantitative and qualitative data in collaboration with uh, industry partners. A third project will be led by Professor Angela Bali Swine, who's an, an, an economist with long experience in doing sustainability research in developing nations. Her project, Estimating the Social Domain of Sustainable Investing in Developing Countries, will focus on impact investing and the balancing of financial returns and impact on, for instance, poverty, health care, education, and employment. Ranjita's research, as has Joachim's and my own, also been previously on microfinance, which should connect nicely to Mullen's research agenda at Lulio Tech Technical University as well. Uh, so for, we have for a long time discussed how to measure and understand the S in ESG models, and there are many, many models out there. A new study by NYU showed that across 12 of the leading and competing reporting frameworks, only 14% uh, social rating products targets investors as compared to 97% for the environment and 80% for governance ratings. Moreover, the S variables are neither standardized and thus not comparable. Thus, we intend to map and evaluate the frameworks and consider how we can make an effort on standardizing social impact models. Finally, uh, Sophie Nakimson Ekvall will continue in her ongoing research on social financing, and I'll let her tell you more about the project herself. So thank you for now, and I'll turn it over to Sophie, who will talk about her project on social financing, and then Max Gustafsson, who is the fund manager and head of governance at Lannebu, who will talk about why Lannebu is collaborating with us. Sophie? Uh, yes, I'm on. And... Uh... Let me stop share here. here. No, I'll, 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 I won't share a picture. I just talk instead. Uh, and now, thank you so much for inviting me to make this presentation and thank you for the whole overall in initiative. So 2020 marked the takeoff of social bonds. Uh, we are talking about a small portion of the global bond market, the global financial market, but, and the, but the green bonds is also still taking a small, up a small part. But last year, the social bond market grew to $150 billion. And the market for sustainability bonds, which are both green and social, so, uh, both catered green and social goals, also reach, uh, reached almost the same size. So there are three drivers for this momentum now. And one is the COVID pandemic, where, where you have, for example, the e-shore bonds that, target, that uh, allocate bank loans to SMEs that cater for employment, like in the private areas. You also have supranational organizations such as the World Bank, but also the Swedish Development Agency, SIDA, that last year issued bonds. And also, of course, what's interesting here for the, from a Nordic perspective are the European regions and municipalities and a large number of property and housing companies 
that target affordable housing and social housing. So Sweden, I mean, we are a front runner on green bonds and we should be proud of that. And we take a lead on the green transition. At the same time, we are really far behind our peers in, in the Western societies when it comes to social bonds and social financing overall. What my research will, show, will challenge is the idea that social financing does not work for a Nordic welfare state regime. So just give us a level playing field. Lynn already touched on it. Green goals and so social goals that are different. Making a huge implication, green CO2 is based on natural sciences. We have, have in place many regulations and standards are guiding us already. The target is the general public. All of us profit from a livable planet. However, social tar targets in contrast, they are contextual. The ad is a problem in a specific place. There's often a specific activity designed to solve a problem for a specific group. Still, preemptive activities are both possible. There can be frameworks developed and they are needed even in, in, the, in a welfare state. From a Swedish perspective then, much of the Swedish corporate bonds and public municipality bonds emanate from investments in infrastructure structure and buildings. So, and there are places where people are, they live there, they work there. We, we, we socialize in, in, in the infra, closest infrastructure and buildings. Here, we also find some of the largest social shyness in Sweden to address. We need to refurbish the million housing program, Miljöprogrammet, in the suburbs, in an affordable way for tenants. We need to challenge insecurity and crime. We know all about it. Integration, segregation, getting jobs for marginalized groups on the labor market. We also have a broad, broader social challenges like loneliness for the elderly, diabetes prevention, and psychological health. Uh, so I describe the development of a social bond market in Sweden as virgin. Still, we do have three sustainable bonds and social bonds. And community invest, the, the, the municipality joined, joined and owned, and Malmö Start are developing frameworks for social bonds as I talk. I also followed the uh, activity of the 20 largest Swedish institutional investors, and I wrote a working paper of that in 2009. I'm making a follow up this spring, and I also would do it again in two years' time. The approach is very fragmented. A few of them do take a clear lead claiming they can find social bonds that are economically viable as an investments. Some build their competence and interest out of the green experience, so we have a transfer of knowledge. Yet there are a number of them that still claim to make the market is too thin, they shy away from risk and social wash. The investment specialists claim they lack a clear mandate from the boards. This is the, what we heard from the green side 10 years ago. So moving on then. What is clear is that for the market to take off, as Lynn also mentioned, Sweden needs to have standardized methodology for social impact measurements. We are still unsure how to evaluate preemptive investments in social development, like extra schooling for, for left behind youngsters. We also have difficulty in developing collaborative platforms between the public sector, private sector, and civil society, often single out as one of the most important societal mind shifts to be able to deliver on Agenda 2030. And we also need to find the, the right balance between what the government should do to uh, instigate the financial market and what the private investors should do themselves. This is the same discussion as we had in the green side, but here the positions are more clear already. Overall, my research addressed the whole field from social bonds, bank loans, bank guarantees, outcome contracts, the latest fad called sustainability linked bonds and loans. To understand what's happening, we need collaborative research interviews and longitudinal case studies, also quantitative research, and to, to be able to describe the drivers and barriers of the development of a social labor financial market in the context of a Nordic welfare state. And thank you very much. And I'm very pleased that Lanabo is wish to collaborate. So please, Max, I hand over to you. Thank you, Sophie, and uh, thanks to all involved for uh, taking the initiative and, and launch of, of SFL. Um, for us, responsible investing is, is at the core of our daily work. I mean, our, our clients ha have trusted us with their savings and capitals, so we must be a responsible investor. 
at heart. It's our duty. Uh, furthermore, we are convinced that strong ESG practices are accretive to investment returns uh, and the opposite. So uh, to uh, encourage and require companies to, to improve their ESG uh, work is an inherent part of our investment process. Um, we are very happy to support SFL uh, from day one. It, it was a very natural thing for us to do. Um, more than 70% of our assets are invested in Swedish companies. So uh, for us, it's really critical that Swedish companies stay competitive and that uh, Swedish capital markets are uh, attractive, uh, relevant, and, and with good practices. Uh, and I'm convinced that SFL, with its multidisciplinary approach, uh, will make a vast contribution. Um, uh, the capital markets have an instrumental role to play for the transition to a sustainable economy. Uh, not least uh, the credit market as a primary, uh, as a huge provider of primary capital. Uh, and um, I mean, social bonds is a market in its early stages. It is growing. Uh, and I do expect it to grow rapidly in the coming years. Um, probably helped or underpinned by the EU taxonomy, which is soon to be implemented, and, uh, and when it will be extended to include social objectives. Um, so uh, Sofie Nachemsson Ekvalls sort of pioneering research will be, it will be very interesting to, to follow. And I'm, I'm convinced that the findings will be uh, of great interest in, in general and also helpful for us in our um, sort of commitment, daily commitment to be a true responsible investor. So um, uh, lastly, I just want to thank, say thank you and wish um, best of luck to SFL and all involved. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, Sophie and uh... Mats, that was very interesting research you presented. Rebecca, what did you think? Definitely, and Mats, very wise, wise words coming from you. I'm thinking back to what the Minister of Financial Markets said, that they have implemented policies to steer capital towards sustainable investments, and you will be a key player in that aspect. And if I'm speaking from a stock market operator perspective, when companies are approaching us and want to come to the market, they're looking for investors. And many investors ask us, how are we going to rank and classify these companies in terms of ESG? Because we want to make sustainable investments. And I think that the Sustainable Finance Lab and the research coming from our scholars is going to play a huge role in creating those guidelines, helping companies and investors to move forward in a more sustainable way. Thank you, Rebecca. That is certainly what we set out to do. I would like to introduce uh, Joachim Sandberg at Gothenburg University and Magnus Enfeld from the World Wildlife Fund. Please, Joachim. Thank you, Kent, and uh, greetings to everyone from Gothenburg. So I'm Joachim, and I'll say some about um, the contributions from University of Gothenburg to the Sustainable Finance Lab. So I think understanding sustainable finance, researching sustainable finance is not only about getting the facts right, about understanding the market, about number crunching as we do in financial research. It's also about understanding values and understanding visions. So it's not only about understanding how the markets work now, but also understanding how they ought to work in the future. So these types of ought questions are what we are engaged in here. So I'm the director of 
Financial Ethics Research Group at University of Gothenburg. So we're a group of people with backgrounds in, we call it PPE, philosophy, politics, and economics. So we're based in a, in a philosophy department. Um, and so we, our interest is in ethical and political questions pertaining to the financial system. So the type of um, research that we will do for the Sustainable Finance Lab um, go under the theme policies and norms for sustainable finance. So let me tell you a bit about that. So we take it that relevant norms here are on three different levels. First, the ethical norms for individuals like you and me. Second, the norms and the standards inherent to an industry, in this case, the financial industry. And third, the sort of the hard norms, the public policies on finance um, instituted by the government. So first, on the individual level, you know, ethical norms pertain to what we expect from each other and what we expect from, from, from ourselves and each other. So, so many individuals, I think, are pondering the ethical questions of, you know, how do I invest in a sustainable manner? How can I help? And those types of questions were what drew me to this area. You know, if I, as an individual, want to be part of the solution rather than the problem, what are my ethical obligations? What are the norms that I should abide by? And um, I'm very happy that this is continually sort of the question that, that um, is raised to me in press interviews. You know, our readers want to know how should they act? What is their role? Um, so at the Sustainable Finance Lab, we want to help people with grappling with these questions because individuals, consumers or individual investors have much power at least as a collective. Perhaps you don't feel very powerful as an individual, but at least as a collective. So um, being philosophers, we are not afraid of exploring ethical questions, even though, of course, we know that they're controversial and people have different opinions. We want to see what makes sense here. So we want to contribute with, uh, uh, we want to continue with contributing to the philosophical or ethical debate here, by, by writing philosophy, writing popularly about this, and also inviting consumers to, to contribute with their thinking. I have this small hope that the, the other category we saw before was general consumers, people on the street. They're logged in now, right? We're all individuals. So second level is the financial industry. Of course, the industry as such has enormous power, perhaps more power than in each individual consumer. I think it's interesting to view the financial industry as sort of its own culture with its own norms and beliefs. And, and what do you guys think? Uh, you know, are there differences between the culture of the financial industry and sort of the man on the street? Um, is the culture uh, and the norms in finance, are they different? Uh, are they sometimes perhaps out of tune with society? So here we see a great role for, for education, um, changing the way we teach people that end up working in the financial industry about their role, about their ethical requirements. But we also see a great role, a great power for the industry to change its norms through self-regulation. So we want to help in this um, uh, development. So therefore, we're working together with standarding uh, organizations, organizations developing guidelines, uh, organizations facilitating an industry dialogue on appropriate norms. So I am, for instance, chairman of the Swedish ISO committee uh, pertaining to sustainable finance. Um, we have recently seen a new development of the Nordic Swan Echo label for investment funds, and, and we're working with them. And of course, we're keeping tap uh, of, of developments uh, um, 
on the EU level in terms of, of this. So we want to continue working with these uh, standarding um, bodies to develop plausible industry standards. The third level, government or public policy. So we've heard from the Minister for Financial Markets that the government of Sweden wants to play a role here. Um, they have um, several activities going on, several policies sort of suggested in this area. Um, they've worked with different kinds of requirements surrounding reporting, of course. Um, recently launched a green sovereign, bo sovereign bond of Sweden, and they've developed suggestions about green savings accounts, among other things. So the government uh, can issue norms that, of course, are the most sort of hardline or hard, hard norms in, uh, in comparison to the soft regulation of industry. So hard regulation through public policies. Of course, we know that that's controversial. Uh, and particularly, I think, among people in finance, you know, what should the government, why should the government step in and, and tell us what to do? We, you know, we're a private industry. But again, I said, in philosophy, we're not scared of controversies. We thrive from controversies. So we're very interested in this controversy about what, is, what are the best policies. So we want to explore how to find policy solutions for sustainable finance that are both just and effective. So effective in steering the industry towards supporting sustainable development and just in the sense that it's not illegitimate uh, for government to have those kinds of policies. So we will here work together with government and public agencies, um, uh, hopefully, and, but we will also take a sort of an outside perspective and try to evaluate the government and what they're doing. Um, is the Swedish government now really supporting sustainable finance in, in the best way? or can more be done? So in this regard, we're, we're also interested in taking an international perspective to sort of compare Sweden with, with other countries. So just to wrap up, I've been talking about these three different levels, the individual and, and the individual ethics, the industry and its norms uh, and standards, and the public policies or the sort of the democratically elected uh, and chosen laws that guide us all. So, so part of the reason for why we've, we've uh, um, put forward this sustainable finance lab is that we want to see more collaboration between agents on these different levels. So we think it's important uh, to have collaboration between individuals and from the financial industry and public policy uh, in this regard to move together and to support each other. So you, you've already heard from, from the minister and you've heard from um, uh, private, um, the private sector. Uh, I want now to introduce a representative of, of consumers in general, or people in general of civil society, namely Magnus from WWF. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, we're very pleased to see the launch of Sustainable Finance Lab and to participate and contribute to it. Uh, the minister said that uh, she referred to the 2015 uh, decision by the parliament that uh, the financial sector must contribute to uh, sustainable development. And uh, I would say that from the WF perspective, we tend to agree and see that it's absolutely essential that the uh, business sector, private sector and financial sector in, in particular need to contribute. Otherwise, we will not be able to uh, achieve the transition that we need to see to maintain uh, stability on our planet for economies and societies. So that means that sustainability and sustainable finance needs to be uh, using forward-looking targets to achieve something that we want to achieve by 2030, 2050, and start measuring that towards if it's the Paris Agreement or the SDGs or the forthcoming uh, Convention on Biodiversity. Uh, it needs to be based on science. Um, uh, was it Daria or someone spoken about? There are deadlines set by the planet, so we need to use the science, uh, in this case, natural sciences from our part, uh, perspective, to understand what is it we need to achieve, what is it we need to be uh, in line with, which comes to the point about, which is currently very much discussed in financial markets, alignment. 
we need to see that uh, financial flows, the capitals, investments are aligned with these targets. And that, that means aligning the entire portfolios of financial institutions, not only individual financial instruments or funds, but looking across uh, the financial institutions as a whole. Um, and we need to measure as was also mentioned by several measure, what this measure, measure gets done. So we need to measure the impact. We need to measure uh, sustainable finance in terms of absolute sustainable sustainability outcomes. So those are quite important uh, guiding stars to use when you're uh, in research, but also in, in practice and in development to see how do we take this forward. And in these short few minutes, there's a lot of uh, good intention and interesting research and projects uh, being discussed and which we look forward to in this uh, lab. But uh, one remark uh, or reflection I would make is that there's a lot of focus and a lot of discussion about green finance, sustainable finance and, and social finance now we discuss as well. But from the initiatives that we see are really, has really been driving and shifting this from, uh, from the last few years. It's about the risks, it's about the threat of unsustainability to, to financial markets and societies. It's about how um, uh, identifying what is driving the negative outcomes. If we have climate change, how come? We need to understand why and, and stop those activities uh, and shift them. And we need to see a transition of all those economic activities which are causing the problem, which means that we need to focus I would say primarily on the non-green uh, uh, activities in societies and uh, economies. And that's also a field for financial, uh, for, for research in the, in the financial sector. So we better can uh, identify and uh, uh, using pricing mechanisms and policies to make sure that we are making those activities unprofitable and so that they can be phased out and replaced by all the great uh, innovative solutions in technology and elsewhere. So. With this um, uh, sort of just as a sort of declaration of our interest uh, in this kind of platform, we look forward to collaborate. And as I think Rebecca started saying, it's about collaboration and we want to bring our expertise in uh, conservation, uh, our experience from various initiatives uh, on the science based targets on the net zero as donor alliance for climate uh, and on the yesterday launched task force on nature related financial disclosure. Uh, and how we have been working ourselves on tools, methodologies and uh, assessments in this field of um, finance and sustainability and look forward to an exciting uh, collaboration on the, the, the sustainable finance lab. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim and Magnus. Rebecca, do you have any reflections on this presentation? Yeah. So interesting, Magnus. Your participation in this will be absolutely vital because I dare to say that you are one of the world's most prominent non-governmental org organizations. You have decades of research backing what you're saying. You have an incredible network. You will be giving us an international outlook. And already today, the same day we're launching, you're giving us a new perspective that we can take into consideration when we continue our work. It's very important. Thank you, Rebecca. I think also think it will be fantastic. We will now hear from Beatrice Krona, who is a director at the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center based at Stockholm University and also at the Global Economic Dynamics and the Biosphere at the Royal Institute, uh, Royal Academy of Sciences, pardon. And she is joined by Fredrik Nyström of Öman Fonder. Beatrice? The floor is yours. Thank you, Kent. And uh, just, just for notice, I'm not the director of SRC, that's Lily Gordon, but I am the deputy di science director at SRC uh, and also at the Royal Academy of Science. But um, thank you anyway, and thank you for um, Magnus and Joachim, particularly Magnus, I thought really nice segue into what I was going to talk about, which is more about impact assessment. And uh, I want to share my screen very briefly uh, before um, and say that um, <clears throat> touching on what Magnus said, I think it's in, super important and at the heart of the core emission of SFL really to both look at how can financial markets help contribute to reducing the harm, but also doing good. And I think that is what impact assessment is about, is about trying to help align those things. And I wanted to show this slide because it gives you an overview and a comparison of sustainable and mainstream capital flows in 2019. It was uh, some estimates that we had published recently because we're seeing a rapid increase in green investments 
And if we take a very broad definition of what is green in line with, for example, the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, then roughly 14% of total global investments were linked to any form of green label in 2019. And in terms of green debt or sustain green or sustainability linked loans or, or bonds, we have seen, as noted by previous speakers, uh, a significant growth, but they still represent a rather small part of total debt issued, at least in 2019. It was less than 0.5%. When we look at equity side, it's looking much better. Green equity figures are much higher, uh, estimated at around 32% uh, of total equity, but still. Uh, and I'll stop sharing that. And <clears throat> but this, so this looks great. But as this green investment movement is ramping up, I think it's really important to unpack what these figures represent. And at the moment, estimates and discussions of green investments, sustainable investments, they tend to include investments that rely on many different types of investment strategies, you know, ranging from negative or positive screening to slightly arguably vaguer claims of ESG integration. We have active ownership and all the way to downright impact investment. And taken together, it's therefore quite clear that what gets labeled as sustainable investment includes a vast uh, array of investment strategies with very arguably very different capacities to promote sustainability. And while impact investment uh, or impact investing in firms that explicitly offer a solution to a social or an environmental problem has generally very clear and measurable targets, best in class and other forms of screening tools like that means that you're just excluding the worst or picking the best. But when we're up against a hard limit with a carbon budget of 500 gigatons of carbon left, if we're going to have a sporting chance of achieving the 1.5 degree target, or when we have a million species threatened with extinction, as noted by the minister earlier. In this situation, we have to ask ourselves if we can consider, um, if it can be considered sustainable to invest in companies that are just a little bit better than their competitors, but still release vast amounts of carbon dioxide or have really big land use or biodiversity footprints. Or should sustainable investments be those that actually set us on the right course, not just a little less off course. And if the answer to that last question is yes, sustainable investments should be those that truly set us on a measurable course away from planetary boundaries or climate tipping points, for example, then we need metrics that can begin to account for the unpriced externalities that are caused by corporate activities in which capital is invested. Metrics that can assess the risk of companies and their investors in aggravating environmental degradation and thus the emergence of systemic risk, which is a threat to the financial sector. Not taking this course risks greenwashing, as was noted by someone in the audience in the chat earlier, and it risks sending us off course despite good intentions. And it means that we need to expand what gets measured beyond a focus on greenhouse gas emissions to a much wider set of processes of relevance for ensuring that we have an environmentally sustainable planet and socially sustainable, but my expertise is in environment. And that includes, for example, water extraction and circulation, land use change, deforestation, these sorts of things, all of which affects biodiversity, which in turn underpins many ecosystem services on which many, many economic sectors depend. And some of this work has already begun in Sweden and internationally, many of our partners and SFL are in fact forerunners in this domain. So investors and regulators are starting to acknowledge that the risk that will emerge if we don't account for this. Uh, and I think this is really encouraging because to achieve rapid transition to, to truly sustainable or true sustainability, we need to this alignment across regulatory policy and across investment policies and practice. So system-wide recognition and measurement of impacts and externalities and the mission of SFL is to bring the latest in earth system science, in climate science and sustainability science in direct contact and dialogue with economics and risk analysis and other relevant uh, academic fields, but also practitioners and contribute to accelerating the pace at which truly sustainable investments can be developed and assessed while grounding this firmly in science. 
at SRC and the Global Economic Dynamics and the Biosphere program that I lead, we've already started developing some prototype metrics that do consider, for example, water, land use change, and climate, as well as their interactions. And this is something that's rarely or never accounted for in existing climate risk or impact assessment frameworks. So we hope to really contribute there, but much more needs to be done to integrate the fast moving scientific domain of assessing impacts on the planet with equally fast moving you know, uh, frameworks for investment decisions and impact assessment in the financial sector. So uh, this means that linking the natural science and metrics to corporate practices and therefore also to investment portfolio assessment. And we look forward to doing this together with current, but also hopefully potential new partners in SFL. And with that, I want to hand over to uh, the word to my industry sparring partner here, uh, Fredrik Nyström from Ermans, to share some of his thoughts and reflections on the role of measurements and metrics for sustainable investment. So Fredrik, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And uh, to you and to the whole team in Sustainable Finance Lab, uh, congratulations. Um, I'm a founder is really looking forward to working together in this uh, great collaboration. Um, and we have chosen to participate uh, since academic research and science-based research is an important input to our sustainability research and into our active ownership processes. It has given us valuable input uh, so that we can measure companies and that we can put forward the right questions to companies when we talk to them and put out the right demands, sufficient amount of demands to, to companies, uh, what they need to, to do to improve. Um, and this uh, we have done for quite a while, but we will become even more important uh, going forward. And there we hope that Sustainable Finance Lab can be great uh, uh, input to, to our work and that we can also put forward our experience into this collaboration. Um, and I'm really thrilled to see how the finance industry is changing and has changed over the last years, going from more or less doing nothing to start talking, um, uh, start caring, and now moving from words to action. Um, and at this important stage, going from words to action, it is important that investors know that we are doing the right thing, right things, and that we are doing enough. Uh, so we can manage, uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know what's happening here. Um, Right. Oh, it will end soon. Sorry for this <laughs> interruption. Um, um, and there will be conflict of interest rising probably uh, with goals to, to, to strive for first. And there we need the science to, to make us uh, make it possible for us to make the right prioritizations. Um, and we have had meetings with companies lately around the new taxonomy, EU taxonomy, as an example. Um, and in many of those discussions, it is evident, unfortunately, that the companies are painting themselves in green as much as possible already today. But we know that they have, be, have to be part of the transition we have to make to meet the um, uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, to meet the, the Paris Agreement, well, well below two degrees, and also, as you mentioned, act within the planetary boundaries while also meeting societal needs. Um, so, so the tool we have as investor is active ownership, where we can make the best effort and make the biggest impact. And, and we, we are hoping that the collaboration here with the Sustainable Finance Lab will, will help us uh, develop those tools, science-based tools, so we have the best arguments when discussing with companies and meeting the company's own arguments and have those fruitful discussion a credible discussion with companies so that we together then also can, can have the best possible impact. So really looking forward to, to working together with you all. Great, thank you very much, Fredrik. And I'm gonna hand it back to Kent to wrap us up. 
Thank you so much, both Beatrice and Frederick, uh, for your valuable insight in regards to responsible investment and ownership. And Frederick, I do really agree with you. We are seeing rapid movement now within the financial industry, and I can't wait to see what we're going to accomplish. Um, this marks the end of this session for today, but it also marks the start of our journey together with the Sustainable Finance Lab. And if there is one word I would like to use to summarize today's session, it's ambition. We are hearing how policymakers, scholars, and corporations want to go in the same direction to accomplish real change. We will draw on our extensive academic and stakeholder networks in both Sweden and globally to make this happen. Vinova has committed to fund the Sustainable Finance Lab for at least the five coming years. And I think that when we meet here in a year, hopefully physically, we will have come a long way in that transition. I am confident that the research lab have delivered influential research, been published in top tier journals with subsequent impact on both research communities and practitioners. We will be displaying research, research covering multiple areas, such as sustainable finance, gender equality, and social sustainability. I think we all feel excited and impatient to, to get going with this work. I would like to thank everyone who has participated during today's session. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for backing us. And thank you for being part of the change. Please make sure to connect with us on LinkedIn to stay tuned for further events and publications. Thank you for this time. We look forward to seeing you soon again.